All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here as always with Drew Dinsick. Today we are going to talk about the Saturday and Sunday games in the NFL. We will talk about the NFC wildcard uh, matchups and we'll talk Browns Texans. We're recording right now during the second quarter of Sunday Night Football Bills Dolphins as the Bills continue to play with their food as is their want. Uh, we'll see how this goes. We don't know at this time the other AFC matchups, so we'll stick with the NFC. But Drew first, or your big big takeaways, big feelings, emotions out of the weekend. Yeah. Uh the uh there apparently are football guys, Jay. <clears throat> and they it's wanted right. to see they wanted to see Matt Stafford and uh company go to Detroit <laughs> because there were some moments where it felt like what do we need to do to make this happen? Yeah. Okay, the Rams need to win. <laughs> like that was kind of a weird win for the Rams, uh, which sends them to Detroit in the three six. Um, my other major takeaways are the uh, the NFC matchups are just all a delight. Um, there are other major takeaways. Um, a bunch of teams that played this weekend that some of them that mattered some of them that didn't had a bunch of injuries that will matter for the playoffs uh and then finally um the jags crashing out of the playoffs for anyone holding a 14 to 1 no playoffs jacks ticket that was kind of nice uh for anyone holding a texans uh to win the south ticket was kind of nice for anyone holding a demeco ryan's coach of the year ticket albeit uh a fraudulent win looks likely <laughs> right now uh and uh yeah it was uh it was a it was it was i guess the best the best uh kind of adjective to use for everything we saw in week 18 was just it was just a just a goofy weekend and there was all of these games had a little bit of a you know circus vibe to them and uh you know i think ultimately there's no one in the playoff mix outside of the steelers who does not belong uh, and there's no one that's in the mix that doesn't belong. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, there's no one I would, I, yeah, yeah, there's no one that I really think is on the outside looking in that really deserved to be, uh, in the mix, I guess is what I would say. Uh, so Steelers will probably be one and done and we can dispatch with them and move on. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think ultimately that I guess the winners of week 18 are probably the Niners and the, uh, Ravens like nobody else looks right there were some injuries all across the board that's going to affect challengers and uh you know I think ultimately this is um you know kind of a little bit of a no nothing burger weekend what was what, what were your takeaways yeah it's strange looking through the matchups nothing really feels super material in terms of how it's going to affect the outlook of the season I think the Eagles were already going uh, south on their own before these injuries started piling up. I will say, as someone who watched a lot of uh, a lot of the Bucks in general the past two weeks, like that offense has got absolutely nothing at the moment. There is absolutely nothing there, and I think it's a it's a big red flag. Like this game against Carolina, I wouldn't read as much into the offense just because Baker Mayfield couldn't like he couldn't move like he and. Credit to him, he got it out. He had one run on third and five where he got crunched by three guys at once to get a first down. Like he is, so I wish you'd want about him, but he's he's certainly tough. Uh, and I mean, he didn't turn the ball over as much as he tried to, but the, the biggest concern <laughs> for me is what they did against New Orleans in the first three quarters while yeah. that game was theoretically in balance, uh, in the balance a week ago where they couldn't do anything against New Orleans. And then Desmond Ritter spends a half just lighting up the New Orleans defense before it all went south, predictably so. So that's a concern for them, the health of Mayfield between his ribs, his ankle. Uh, it's not looking great. And I think that, I mean, if it were the Saints uh, in the four seed playing Philadelphia, you'd be feeling pretty confident in the Saints. But this Bucks team just is is pretty uninspiring at the moment. Uh, my biggest memory, though, from the weekend, and not so it doesn't really have that many ramifications across the league, but um, just from a personal betting perspective, uh, as someone who needed the Texans uh, for a variety of re reasons for the division, I am a, a D'Amico Ryan's uh, Coach of the Year man, uh, and I agree it is a uh, very fraudulent position, but it's good to be on the side of Brian Dayball and Malcolm Brogdon for once, Drew. I like cheering yeah. for the, uh, <laughs> the choice that has a ton of public momentum uh, but I would say it doesn't have a great deal of merit given that, uh, you know, he got CJ Stroud. And that's basically, 
his coach of the year case, but it is it is a great story if you just look at it from surface level, going from eleven combined wins in three seasons and three wins last year and the longest odds to win the AFC to ten wins in the division. Yeah. Now it's, we don't have to go into any of the details beyond that, but uh, yeah, he wouldn't be on my personal ballot, but I do think he is. Uh, I would have him the favorite from here over to the fancy. Though. I don't think that is locked up. Some people are talking about that as a foregone conclusion. I would no not way. That. We're not going to know until they till they tally. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. Yeah, Brian's we'll, the favorite nope. for me, but not, yeah. no lock. There'll be some tra- vote trackers out there that will give us a sense before we get to uh, February 8th. February 8th, 9th, whatever they do the awards show, uh, we'll get a, uh, we'll have a sense. But uh, right now it feels very, very 50-50 between Stefanski and Ryan's to me. Yeah, we'll see. It's it's interesting because I think that if you if you do take a step back and look at, just look at their cases and the kind of archetypes that they follow and what typically resonates with voters, if you just outlined their, what both of those coaches represent and their coach of the year resumes before the season, to people, I think it would be like, well, D'Amico Ryan's is going to win in a landslide. Like yeah. D'Amico Ryan's going from three yeah. wins to 10. And Stefanski, well, he went 11 and six in his wild card. Yeah, they've had four quarterbacks, but they got the best defense in football and they've got all these other injuries. But that doesn't resonate as loudly as the Ryan story. But because of the sequencing and because Stefanski got so entrenched and Ryan's didn't clinch the playoffs until Saturday night and didn't clinch the division until the final day of the season, it is going to be a good... It'll be a really good test case just going forward on how mm. late in the piece the voters actually decide. Because, yeah. I mean, there's a chance the fans he might win with, I don't think he's going to win super comfortably, but if he were to win and he wins with like 30 first place votes, then that's a really good indicator going forward that, you know, a lot of people make up their minds before the final weekend of the season, or at least strongly leaning in one direction. Um, but yeah, that'll be interesting. But <clears throat> for me, watching that, uh, that Jags game against the Titans uh, and needing the Titans to win for D'Amico for the division. Uh, I, I have a habit of when I'm watching a game where I have a big position, I just drink way too much water. That's just my thing. <laughs> where I really overhydrate. Uh, and so I had to go to the bathroom uh, in a, like a pivotal moment in the fourth quarter. And, uh, you know, at my, my bathroom, I was watching at NBC um, and uh I, I didn't. I didn't get there as quickly as I wanted to because I bumped into someone and said a quick hello, and it was uh, it was Jason Garrett, the 2016 NFL Coach of the Year. Classic. Uh, I thought it was maybe a good omen for uh, D'Amico, but that was a ridiculous game. It just goes to show that, like, if he does, if Ryan's does win Coach of the Year, I think it'll largely be because of two plays. Uh, it'll be the, the fourth and one that Tyler Goodson doesn't catch and Minshew doesn't make the throw, and then also. Uh, Trevor Lawrence had Calvin Ridley wide open for a walk in, uh, what I think would have been a 70, 70 yard touchdown bomb, yeah. and then they would need the two points to tie it up. And the way that Tannehill was playing down the stretch, uh, it is no guarantee that the fans would march down the field. So, no, it is real. And both both of those passes hit, hit the hands of the receivers, yep. so basically like one inch either way. Uh, and D'Amico Ryan, instead of being your coach of the year, arguable favorite and hosting a playoff game. Uh, he's nine and eight, and uh, and yeah. out of the playoffs. So yeah. Hey Jay, it's a game of inches. Yeah. And also, let it never be said that uh, your co-hosts of Bet the Edge do not sweat their bets because <laughs> yes, you should be hydrated as you yeah. are watching the absurdity of Week 18 play out. Um, and actually, like, uh, like St- Shane Steichen out coached. Um, <clears throat> Demeco Ryan's pretty cleanly in week 18, but CJ Stroud was just on another level. And yeah. <clears throat> CJ Stroud I mean, said this publicly. We, I think we agree on this. Like, he succeeded in spite of the way the coaching went down for that particular game. Um, and <clears throat> I think that actually is something that we need to sincerely consider as we look at this matchup, particularly in the wild card round. Cause, like, typically when you're uh, you know, a, de- a playoff debutante, there is a little bit of an expectation that the nerves are going to get to you. Uh, but that was effectively a playoff game for the Texans. And you know who was absolutely cool as a cucumber? Who was, um, like, performed at a level that was exceptionally impressive on the road? It was C.J. Stroud. And now he's at home. 
Uh, and it's been a while since I've looked at the Browns defense and been like, yeah, I'm impressed. Like they've been kind of sloppy for like six weeks. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very, very interesting to try to kind of synthesize like not impressed with the coach and the offensive coordinator for the Texans after what we just saw in a moment where their backs were against the wall. Like, and like that, that's like when your back is against the wall, which is a playoff environment, that is like when your true colors show. And I thought the Texans kind of philosophy, the sequencing, their ability to put the ball, you know, the game in the hands of CJ Stroud when he was performing at such an astronomically impressive level, it was, it was concerning. And I don't know if they like reviewed the tape and they're like, oh, I guess, I guess we have a guy. <laughs> oh, 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 wait. Oh, wait. Our, oh, our, our quarterback is, is very good. But, but, but you know what? Actually, you know what? Maybe we don't need 24 carries for Devin Singletary for 2.6 a clip. Like, I, I, like it was, it, it, it's possible that they go through a little bit of growth now that they are in the playoffs. Um, but uh, yeah, like the most kind of consequential and instructive game that we saw um, all weekend was Colts Texans. And honestly, the Texans uh, were the better team. Clearly CJ Stroud was a better quarterback clearly, but uh, there were kind of specific, I thought coaching decisions that made that closer than it should have been. Uh, and if Gardner Minshew completes a very makeable pass, uh, we might be talking about Colts hosting the four or five matchup instead of the Texans. Yeah. You know, it's funny as um, uh, I got this D'Amico position with one of our mutual friends and we were talking about during the game being like, geez, I wish we were cheering Steichen. Instead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Steichen, I think, I think he was never going to win uh, because he just doesn't have the public voter sentiment that came out. And I think that's, sure. that's wrong. And I think, uh, I mean, Steichen would still probably be in my top three if I had a ballot, even with the loss, um, because why Why does Shane Steichen, why is he not the coach of the year? Because Gardner Minshew didn't complete one pass. Like that doesn't, shouldn't change anything, but that's how it works and people go off results. But there is just something to having a coach like Steichen where you just know that he is going to make the optimal decision uh, when they were just running the ball down Houston's throat, when they realized they had to pass more, the th- the the play call, and this is the most infuriating thing that has come out of the weekend, is that people are criticizing Steichen for taking the ball out of Jonathan Taylor's hands. It's like, man, they it was like a run blitz. Like they sold out to stop the run, and the play was wide open, and you need your quarterback to complete a regulation pass, and you're probably you probably would have ended up probably winning the division. It was a perfect play call. Was, he did everything right, uh, and Minshew didn't yeah. create, he didn't make the throw, and maybe Tyler Goodson should have caught that. But it wasn't easy, so that was tough. But on, I, on top of the fact that his execution on that drive was like, we're watching a genius. Yes. Like, I, like, I, like, I'm watching it. I'm like, oh my god, yeah. he's going to win this with zero seconds on the clock. Yep. Like he knows he needs to, and yep. he's going to do it. <laughs> like this, this is incredible. Like, yeah. I, it, it is wild that we are here now and they're out. And he was the yeah. best guy of the weekend. Yeah. Uh, the other thing too is the people are criticizing, like, why do you take Jonathan Taylor out? I'm not sure Jonathan Taylor could move laterally uh, anymore because he sure. was banged up. He was ruled doubtful to return, and then he just showed up with a helmet on. And that's another thing that uh, what is remembered from games is so colored by the final result. But like my overarching memory from that game will be, well, CJ Stroud will be the number one, but the number two will be Jonathan Taylor, who. He was 2021 JT again, and that was an insane performance. Uh, And as someone who was cheering against the Colts, he was absolutely terrifying. And the fact that he came out there for that final drive, but all he could really do was like run straight. (laughs) Like he couldn't, I'm not sure he could have gotten out there uh, in the flat, but in any case, the Colts are done, the Texans move on and they play the Browns uh, in the four five. Right now we're looking at a line of Browns minus two. The total is 44 and a half in Houston. Uh, I agree with all he takes on Bobby Slowick. Uh, someone who's cheering the Texans. That was absolutely painful to like, why are you, why are you ever running on second and 10 when you have CJ Stroud and you're going up against a defense that has not shown that they can stop you at all. Uh, and it really felt like it was only, it was 14, six at half. It felt like it should have been 28. It felt like yeah. the game should have been Thank completely you. over. It should have been over. <clears throat> and well, and also, this is, uh, I mean, <laughs> Kyle Shanahan has always had an issue with his fourth down conservatism. Andy Reid has had that issue. 
not throwing D'Amico Ryan's in the caliber of those guys, but he has this issue too where uh, it's one to be conservative in a nutshell compared to like Steichen who will just go for it with Gardner Minshew when it's the right call, but to not go for it when you have uh, Brock Purdy, uh, when you have CJ Stroud, when you have Patrick Mahomes, there is something yeah. more infuriating about that. Uh, and it was, I mean, it's the reason it was a game late. So how much, how much do you think the Texans' offense is going to um, self-immolate against the Browns and their defense? Okay. <clears throat> this is that that part of the question is impossible to answer. Uh, okay, okay. So what what matters for this game? <clears throat> the Browns' defense is on the road, less effective. Just know that uh, the Browns' defense is playing somewhat uh, different football than they were playing in September and October. Right, these guys were the monsters of midway, and you know, in in, in uh, the fall, and they have come. They have definitely shown some cracks. Uh, the fact that they could be full strength uh, definitely gives me a little bit of hope that the Browns are going to be able to put up a defensive effort here. Um, but the what matters most in this game is how healthy are the pass catchers for the Texans. Right, Nico Collins um, in the first half of that game, like. Why didn't he have 15 targets, Jay? Yeah. That guy was dominating. He was dominating. In the second half, he looked a little bit like a little like he was feeling it. Uh, you know, there was definitely some sign that he was not feeling 100%. We know that Noah Brown has missed time. We know that uh, Robert Woods has missed time. Like, in general, Tank Dell, I don't think, is coming to the rescue here. So, like, there is a little bit of a deficiency in terms of skill position players right now for the Texans because no one besides Nico Collins was really doing much. Um, and so I think, you know, if it, if this is literally like we're going to war against the, the mighty Browns and it's, CJ Stroud and Dalton Schultz, who are a little bit not on the same page for whatever reason, uh, that's that spooks me. Um, I will say though that uh, certainly the Texans defense is wildly fraudulent. Know this, right? Like, uh, congratulations to potential coach of the year, um, Demeco Ryan's, for elevating the um, Texans defense from 18th in EPA per play to 16th in EPA per play with an easier schedule. It's a great like thing. <laughs> the <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to hurt your position. I just am still like kind of like laughing at how stupid this award is. Uh, but like honestly, like it's not a good defense. Like frankly, um, Will Anderson, he's not going to get right in the week. Uh, you know, like the likelihood that they are effective at creating pressure on Joe Flacco, I don't see it. Uh, so I think this is probably Browns or pass. I think the number should be closer to a pick, even though it is two, and I'm saying it's Browns or pass. Uh, it's it's just I I don't realistically think the Texans can get healthy enough on offense uh, to be able to hurt a Browns defense that is a little bit you know it's, that had had a week off. Like I'm treating the Browns coming into this game like they they're coming off a bye, and I think that's the right way to treat them. And I think you got to bump them one and a half points. I think you got to bump them like eight percent win probability. Uh, just for the fact that they're coming off of uh, a bye. <laughs> I think the Texans at home, they are definitely much more, much, much, much more, more alive than they would be if this game was happening in Cleveland. Uh, but uh, I still think that, you know, the first actual playoff start for Stroud could get a little weird. Uh, and certainly first playoff start for, you know, Slovak, who seems to be extremely conservative, is a little weird. Yeah, I think to me... The most instructive thing out of the Houston indie game wasn't so much Slowick and the conservative play calling because they've been, uh, I mean, their pass rate over expected has been negative all season despite having CJ Stroud. But to me, it was the fact that basically their entire defensive line, the Texans, was on the injury report. And you never know if that's like, okay, these just weird yeah. niggling injuries and they're not going to affect you. Like all those, all of them, all of those guys look done physically. Uh, yeah, tons of too. Stop. They could not stop the run at all. And this was for all the uh, how D'Amico's defense might be a bit overrated. Like the run defense isn't. The run defense has been excellent all year. And it was excellent against Cleveland two weeks ago when Cleveland couldn't do anything on the ground. It's just the Flacco was sure. connecting on all these deep bombs. And so like how much of that is 
like are, th- are these guys going to get healthier? Like, is, is Will Anderson just done? Because it seems like he's done because he's been limping around. Uh, and it felt like they were only they were trying to use him as just the third down pass rusher, but they couldn't because Jerry Hughes went down. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, you're all that's left, Will. You have to just get out there. And he's yeah. uh, on yeah. one leg with the high ankle sprain. Like Rankins, Collins, Barnett, are these guys going to be right? Because if they're not, then that's a huge problem. What I come back to, though, is I just think the Flacco just ultimately just cannot keep getting away with this, uh, given that he, has had, <laughs> he, could have had, he could have thrown five picks against the Jets. Like oh, yes, surely. Uh, and surely. I just think of, you know, and this is overly reductive, and obviously there are so many more things at work, but Joe Flacco on the road against CJ Stroud uh, with the Cleveland defense that, I also think back to how Trevor Simeon marched the Jets down the field on that first drive against the Browns. Like the Browns yeah. aren't, to your point, they're not the fearsome. They're still excellent, but I don't think they're the fearsome unit that they were um, at the beginning of the season. So, yeah, I would lean regrettably to the Texans, but uh, I don't feel amazing about it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'm probably not betting this game, which really pains me because there's six amazing games. I, 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 I want to bet them all. Um, I can make a case for the Texans. I can make a case for the Browns. I can make a case for the over. I can make a case for the under. Um, this is a good line. Anything around pick is a good line. Anything around 44 is a good line. Um, I just, uh, I think we're going to learn a lot about the state of the teams in terms of their approach and mindset in the first half of this game. So probably the most plus EV bet on this game is going to come at halftime. Okay. Feels to me like the Texans win and then get blown out 41-10 by Baltimore the following week. All right. Uh, reigning National Player of the Year, Caitlin Clark. Drew continues her incredible senior season Wednesday on Peacock. Clark and Iowa head to Purdue, where the Boilermakers are undefeated at home. Watch two of the hottest teams in the Big Ten face off at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Peacock. Big Caitlin Clark house. I'm not even. I'm not even joking. Caitlin Clark in Iowa. That's the most compelling college basketball we're going right now. Oh, much more than a yeah. mu- much better story than anything going on on the men's side. Yeah, I order a lot of merch, so it kind of doesn't mean anything. <laughs> there is some uh, Caitlin Clark merch on its way as we speak to the crowd <laughs> household for my three daughters. I All right, uh, let's talk NFC Wild Card Weekend matchups: Lions, Rams. Uh, three and a half point dogs oh, at the Lions, which is surprising. The total is a massive 51 and a half. The Eagles don't know who is going to be playing in this game, but they are two and a half point favorites at the Bucks. Two and a half? Five. Yeah, it's up to two and a half. And, what? And, and the Cowboys are seven point favorites home to the Packers, and that's starting to trend towards seven and a half. The total is 48. So choose your favorite game of the three. Drew, we'll talk about it. Lions, Rams, obviously. <laughs> We've been waiting for this. Stafford v. Goff. Dan Campbell versus McVay. McVay versus Goff, right? Like, this is freaking beautiful. Um, uh, Give me the Rams plus three and a half. I kind of can't believe that this line is actually going to be widely available. Again, we're recording this on Sunday at 6.30 Pacific time. If I can get three and a half on this game, I'm going to be laughing like a giddy child. Um, Three, this the fair is three. Like, let's not be, let's not mince words here. Like, there's zero chance that the Lions are that much better, particularly having potentially lost Sam Laporta, uh, particularly having a defense that uh, can be shredded specifically by the way the Rams want to run their offense. Like, this is a disastrous matchup for the Lions defense. Uh, and while the Lions were magnificent in winning and covering today, uh, they let Nick Mullins uh, get the better of them a lot in that game. And I think that uh, is you know worth paying attention to. This linebacking core, the secondary for the Lions, it's a huge problem. Uh, I think the Rams are going to be able to get into the uh, high to mid, mid to high 20s here, uh, which makes them live to win this game. Uh, and I think um, <clears throat> Rams defense is still being a little underrated by market. People assume they stink. Uh, they played a lot of really good offenses and they've held their own somewhat. Uh, so I think ultimately this is going to be a game decided by three points either way. And if you can get the hook with the Rams, I think you get it. And I think the Rams are alive for this upset, honestly. And I think, um, you know, they could punch their ticket to play San Francisco again. Uh, they could be headed to Dallas after this one. It's tough to say. Uh, or if Green Bay does the impossible and beats Dallas, uh, you can see a setup here where the Rams could go on a little bit of a run. Uh, and make some noise in the NFC. But I I look at the NFC as significantly flatter 
than the market currently makes it. Uh, some of that is like I look at Brock Purdy as a guy that could be seeing ghosts if things go wrong in a given game. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just in general, like the injuries and, and what happened with uh, uh, Detroit right now are not built into that line. Yep. I think that's fair. I think that the point on the Rams, their defense in terms of the schedule they've played, like they've had to play uh, at Baltimore. They played they played home to San Francisco in week two and they're actually playing the real San Francisco. They had to play home to Philadelphia at Dallas where you compare that to, say, uh, Jacksonville, who were a top 10 defense, I believe, at the midpoint of the season. And they really hadn't played anyone outside of uh, Kansas City, who turned out were not all world, and then Buffalo, where Buffalo just couldn't convert a single third down, but otherwise moved the ball pretty well um, in London. So I'm with you on the Rams. I think that three is the right line. This feels like the ultimate um, incredible spectacle of uh, two teams who will not make the Super Bowl ultimately, <laughs> but uh, it, will be, it should be an incredible spectacle. So on the Rams' defense, um, who do you think wins Defensive Rookie of the Year now? That uh, that Will Anderson, Jalen Carter, and Kobe Turner all did effectively nothing this weekend. Jalen Carter, I guess. I honestly have no clue. <laughs> what do you think? Is this going to be a chaotic? Is going to be a chaotic uh, split vote? I actually I don't have a great feel for this race, but even with that lack of feel, I feel relatively confident Will Anderson is going to win. Because really? I think there is now, there is such a stench around the Eagles and Carter has done nothing the second half of the season and Turner's stats are just better than him. But I don't think people are going to be willing, prepared to vote for Kobe Turner, Defensive Rookie of the Year. And when you just look at the three, there are three very imperfect cases. And I think that Will Anderson is the guy who has arguably the most pedigree, uh, who is on the team that has the best vibe I would say in terms of its defense like no one thinks the Rams have an amazing defense no one thinks the Texans do either but they have a better defense than the Rams in perception uh, and Anderson is a much bigger part of their defense than Turner is for the Rams at least that's the perception there too so I think Will Anderson is going to get like 19 first place votes and then a ton of second place votes uh, and ultimately win the award but um, that's just okay. uh, yeah Kobe Kobe Turner not even really a meaningful um margin in terms of overall statistical um profile relative to byron young who's also yeah. a rookie on the rams <laughs> like, like, yeah yeah diaby like yeah right right it's gonna be carter or anderson ultimately because yeah. those are the okay. guys that have pedigree and those are the guys that people know and i think that carter there is such a stench around this eagles team now and i okay. think that when it comes down to it like i think anderson has one more sack than carter he has more pressures um he is part of a team that is yeah, yeah. the buzziest <clears throat> team in the NFL right now. A team that won their division. Yes, against a team that um absolutely um destroyed itself over the last month of the season. Yeah. Seeing tweets about should Nick Sirianni be fired this weekend, which is incredible. What? <laughs> yeah, I, there was I, I, as someone who's fading the Eagles, or more to the point, fading Jalen Hurts all right. MVP all season. I was yeah. worried at one point this team was going to go fifteen and two. All um, right, you want you want to you want to know uh, one thing real quick. Uh, the the toxicity that exists in the city of Philadelphia. If the Eagles were fully healthy, yeah, and they were on the road as the wild card five seed, I would be banging the table. Like, yeah. pay attention. This team can win. They are good enough. They can win. They have an, they have a coaching advantage. Pay attention, right? Like, well, they're not healthy, so I'm gonna have to cool my jets. Um, but the fact of the matter is, they are probably better off this year being on the road because, like the boo birds coming out in Philly and impacting this team would be just brutal. Oh, and yes, uh, thank you to our producer, Adam. Uh, the fact that they put Patricia, they gave Patricia the keys. I, I, I look, if you want to fire Sirianni because he gave Matt Patricia the keys. I, I, okay. I'll listen. Yeah, no, I, yeah, it's, it's incredible. I thought there was, a, there was a brief time when I thought that Sirianni might win coach of the year when he was 10 and one, I thought he'd be in the mix anyway. And obviously, uh, he's going to be nowhere near it. Um, let's stay on that game. Eagles two and a half point favorites. I think this is a difficult game to talk about without knowing what the statuses are of um, their three best players on offense, uh, at least in terms of the quarterback and the two best skill position players and AJ Brown and Devontae Smith, Jalen Hurts, uh, whose finger was completely mangled on his throwing hands. Uh, he said he is day to day. You would expect that he is going to be out there. But AJ Brown, it's always 
difficult when um, you log on to Twitter and see that um, the Eagles have ruled out an ACL tear for AJ Brown. All right, well, is he going to play this week? Because that's not a great sign. <laughs> oh, good. And then, oh, wonderful. Yes. Yeah, so wonderful. The single worst thing that can happen. But uh, <laughs> Devontae Smith as well would have to be in some – there would have to be some concern mm. around him and his effectiveness – the problem is, is that they're playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, whose defense is not particularly good. And if Baker Mayfield, if he's not the guy, if he's not fully healthy, then uh, even against this Eagles defense, I mean, they, they could do absolutely nothing against the Carolina um, defense through the air today after being able to do nothing against the Saints defense. So I would still probably lean Eagles at two and a half, but I don't feel great about it. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the injuries to A.J. Brown and Hurts matter a lot. Um, the Eagles' defenses cannot be trusted. Uh, that said, <laughs> under 45, I think, is the right bet here. Uh, Eagles going on the road. Tampa Bay in general with Baker Mayfield suffering from his own set of injuries. Like, if this is a high-scoring affair and a clean offensive game, I'll be surprised. This has, like, <laughs> a little bit of, like, a gladiator um, type of a feel to it. Right, where these two teams are literally just battling it out, and like the last survivor uh, tends to get, come through with a field goal towards the end of the game. Eagles have a better kicker, <laughs> so I'll lean Eagles. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think the fact that this is two and a half is amazing to me. I think ultimately there will buck, Bucks money will show. I think there probably is should be around a pick, uh, and I think uh, I hope it gets there. I would. Bet the Eagles at a pick, and I I think the under is the right call at forty five. Yeah, I just the weakness of the Eagles is their <laughs> pass defense. Um, let's put aside the injuries for the time being, but it's the pass defense, and particularly just giving up explosive plays through the air. The Baker Mayfield that I saw today can't throw the ball through the air, uh, yeah, <laughs> and correct. he needs to get right. And it's just very difficult to project what the matchup is going to look like without seeing what Baker looks like on the first drive, because if he is the same guy that physically that he was today. And I think this team is is they're just they're just done. Like they're not going to be able to to go right. up against a real team and beat them if Baker is like they didn't score a touchdown today against the Panthers and again was to clinch the division. And honestly, like the actual like uh, like the mo like the throwing motion from Baker Mayfield, like he looks mess he looks extremely wrong. Yep. No, I uh I agree. It's it, he's not right at the moment. All right, let's go quickly on Packers, Cowboys, Cowboys minus seven, total forty eight. Anything on this guy? Yeah, I was really hoping to get seven and a half. Not going to happen. So I think I'm out on this one. I agree the Cowboys should be favored. I think the Packers are a little bit live here, uh, but uh, ultimately um, the uh, Cowboys offense can cook this Packers defense pretty obviously. Um, I think the total sitting at 48 uh, is laughable. This should be the highest total of all the playoff games. Um, my fare right now is 52, so I'm going to be on the over. Actually, whoa, this is actually the biggest delta I have for the current totals we're looking at um, over for me, for Packers-Cowboys. Yep. No, I'm uh, I'm with you there. I think that the Packers, as impressive as they were against the Bears, I still don't think they've shown much to suggest that their defense is fixed. Uh, and I think that uh, Dak should be able to do whatever he wants um, in that matchup. And then at the same time, like Jordan Love is going to finish as like, what is he going to be like the fifth quarterback in EPA per play of the season? Like it's insane uh, that he's doing this without, um, he's certainly in the top 10. I think he really creeped up today with his performance and with guys like Mayfield falling off. Uh, the fact that he's doing this with this limited of a supporting cast um, is kind of incredible. Uh, but going up against Parsons and Lawrence and Co. Uh, will be a bit more difficult, but the Dallas pass defense can be had. And and Stefan Gilmore, it looks like he's going to play, but he may be um, he may be playing hurt as well. So I'm with you on the yeah. Other. Jordan Love uh, top five. He will finish yeah. top five in total yeah. EPA because uh, the only two guys ahead of him are playing right now, uh, yeah. and that and Brock Purdy, uh, and uh, yeah. So yeah, he will finish in the top five. Uh, really. Really, really impressive season from him. Um, weird, weird game today against the Bears. Um, they score 17 points, but they moved the ball like it was absolutely no issue against a very good defense. Um, <clears throat> I would be I would be surprised if uh, uh, if they don't ultimately uh, um, do some serious damage. 
uh, on the you know on the scoreboard at least. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. There was there's one other quarterback ahead of him besides Brock Purdy, Josh Allen, and Tua, and that is Mr. Dak Prescott, who is also in this game, Jay. Uh, yeah. So yes, uh, C.D. Lamb and Dak right now are. A, oh. What a fuck! What excuse me? What a connection that those two yeah. guys have. I mean, it is it is really something. And honestly, like I know you don't think there's really a window for C. Lamb to steal OPOI. There wasn't enough, you know. It wasn't a long enough runway for him to to make some noise. But uh, I mean, if you made me choose C. D. Lamb or Tyreek Hill at this moment, I'm probably taking C. D. Okay, I'd take Tyreek Hill, but that's okay. <laughs> it's been an amazing season. <laughs> All right, uh, before we close out, <laughs> national champion will be crowned tonight when you're listening. So to get ready, to get you ready for Michigan versus Washington, Vaughn Delzell, Brad Thomas, and Eric Froton are back with one more Q&A on our NBC Sports YouTube page. Join the guys at 1 p.m. Eastern as they break down player props, live betting strategies, and much more. Drew, final thought on the national championship game where the line has bumped up to... Michigan five and a half, total 56 and a half. Any final Oh, yeah. big blue money into the close. Yeah. My why, goodness. Why, was, why did the line open for? And it was baffling to me. Well, why was there, why the Washington money came in weirdly in the middle of the cycle, which I never really understood. I was like, whoa, is this going to close? Is this going to three? Like, that, no way. Like, I, did I misread this entirely? Because, yeah, I mean, like, fair price is probably six, six and a half. And I think, uh, you know, it could get to six. We'll see. Um, but uh, ultimately, I like uh, Michigan in the first half here because I think their advantages are largely in the trenches. And when you have a game of this magnitude and when you have, you know, the adrenaline pumping early and you get the big bodies, uh, particularly for the D-line of the Wolverines, uh, I think it's going to be tough for Washington to find their f- rhythm and their flow offensively early in this contest. And so, yeah, I think Michigan first half minus three is a fun bet. That's the biggest stake I've got in this one. Uh, and then I think Michigan ultimately wins the title. Okay. I agree with you. I don't understand what has been happening with Washington's rating all season long, going from three and a half point favorites home to Oregon and then 10 and a half point dogs on neutral. And then what uh, Texas was what close four and now only five and a half Michigan. I thought this line was going to be a touchdown. So Michigan would be the side uh, for me. All right. We are done. Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks for those of you watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. And if you're listening to us in podcast form, don't forget to rate and subscribe. Also a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to amazon.com slash NBC Sports. From Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick, we'll see you soon.